And the subject? Sanitary pads. <laughs> I must admit, it's a little odd when I'm at a dinner party and people ask what I do. <laughs> and I say, I work at PATH and I'm working on sanitary pads. But I have to tell you, it's something I'm genuinely passionate about. And I'm going to tell you why. Meet Beatrice. She's 12 years old. She lives in Uganda with her grandmother, her sisters and brothers, both of her parents died of HIV some time ago. And one morning, she wakes up, walks to the community latrine in the dark with her little sisters, and discovers that she's bleeding. She's scared. This has never happened before. She doesn't tell anybody. But the next day, when it's still going on, she gets the courage to tell her grandmother. And her grandmother says, Beatrice, you are now a woman. And this is going to happen every month. Well, <laughs> as if that's not bad enough. <laughs> she tells her what her options are. And her options include old rags, old towels, old newspapers, her school notebooks, paper, leaves, grass, ash, and even dung. And Beatrice thinks about this, because even if she could find a way to keep the rags in place, because she doesn't have any underwear, she thinks about school, where there's one latrine for about 400 kids. And also, her teacher at school is a male, and she thinks about how it's going to feel when she has to say she needs to be excused a couple times a day to use the latrine. Um, and she also thinks about the, the boys in her class who are definitely going to tease her even more than they already do. And it's a little daunting to think about how she's going to manage this. She finds out that, in fact, a few of the shops in town sell imported sanitary pads. But then she hears the bad news, that they cost $1.30 for a pack of six. Her brother is the only one who earns any money, and he brings home a dollar a day. So Beatrice starts to notice that girls, the older girls at school, are missing school like four or five days a month, and then a bunch of them just stop going altogether. And Beatrice, too, starts to miss school. And yet, we know that everything changes when a girl is educated. Some studies in Uganda and Ghana have showed that 30 to 50 percent reduction in school absenteeism, when a girl has sanitary pads and underwear. Girls who complete secondary school are less likely to get HIV, less likely to get pregnant when they're young, more likely to have fewer children, more likely to have a job with a higher wage, and they're more likely to educate their own children. Girls are a good investment. So, what's my connection? I was 12 and living in Uganda with my family. We moved there, in fact, right after I had started my period. And yet, my mother brought with us enough sanitary pads to sink a ship. <laughs> <laughs> For my sisters and myself. I didn't ever have to think about it or worry about it. You know, and I have to admit, in my privilege, it never occurred to me what a Ugandan girl did. It didn't occur to me until four years ago. I was flying home from Uganda, as it happens, back to Seattle to PATH, where I work, and a, a friend on the airplane said, what do you think girls in Africa do when they have their periods? I was dumbfounded. I couldn't believe, in all my years of living overseas, working with PATH for 20 years, I had never thought about it. And I didn't know what the answer was, but I was pretty sure it wasn't tampons. And I decided at that moment, this is something I needed to work on. The next time I went back to Uganda, I happened to run into a very creative Ugandan engineer who was making an incinerator. I was working on medical waste. I'm not sure if I've gone up or down in my career path here, but... <laughs> but uh, anyway, that interests me a lot, too. <laughs> So 
um, I was talking to him about the incinerator. I said, whatever inspired you to make an incinerator? Not a lot of people think about that. And he said it was to get rid of the sanitary napkins from girls' schools. I was so excited. <laughs> I mean, you know, you got to understand, nobody talks about this issue. I said, what do girls use? And he said, oh, anything they can get their hands on. And, I, and he said, that's why I'm making sanitary pads out of papyrus and old paper. I couldn't believe it. And he said, but the need is so huge, I can't keep up with it. And then, not long after that, somebody else approached us, and she was looking for ways to make sanitary pads out of banana fiber. And this just seemed like the kind of thing PATH could do something about. PATH is a global public health organization. We often look for technologies-related solutions for unmet, unmet public health needs. And we always look for solutions that are culturally appropriate, that are technically feasible, they're innovative, and that are affordable. I mean, that's really the bottom line. They have to be affordable or there is no product. And we call this the art of the possible. So in the case of sanitary pads, we, we started looking at what people are currently using, and there were three obvious kind of directions. Two of them, the ones on the middle and right, are reusable options. The middle one is a purpose-made reusable cloth sanitary pad, and the one on the right is a um, menstrual cup or menstrual sponge. It's a similar concept. And the one on the left is a disposable pad. So it's, it was really appealing, the idea of a reusable product, because the, you don't have to throw them away very often. The cups last for 10 years or so. And, and the pads are the, the approach that girls and women are using now, so it seemed like a pretty good fit. But then as we started looking into it more, we realized that you know, there are some very real challenges. For one, both of those have a much higher upfront cost, and that alone can be a complete barrier. And then also, they both require access to clean water and to soap to, to make sure that they're not going to be getting infections if they're not using a clean product. And those are, you know, not always available, and they're increasingly scarce, especially with water. So there's another aspect, too, in that... Um, they require a girl or woman to feel comfortable handling blood, and blood that you know, potentially is infected with HIV or hepatitis B or C. So um, we started looking at the idea of a disposable pad. I, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool recycler myself, and so you know, I didn't really, and having worked in medical waste, as I said, I didn't really you know, like the idea of a disposable, but on the other hand, it had the appeal of being something that was initially much more affordable up front. Um, and it, we heard from, you know, it, some of the few studies that have been, been done in this area that it's something that girls and women preferred. If they could have a disposable, that's what they wanted. And also, they're, they're pretty absorbent. Um, so th the downside, you know, they're disposable. And in systems where there are very poor sanitation structures, that's a real issue. It's a real consideration. Um, also, you know, as we know, that they're made with plastics in order to make them, you know, hold in the blood. And so, you know, that's a challenge. So, we started thinking about what would be some more affordable options for something that was absorbent. And we are so lucky to be right here in Seattle where we have two of the world's leading experts in um, forestry and paper fiber in University of Washington and Weyerhaeuser. And so with University of Washington, we had this idea of what could we use that would be totally free um, to make the absorbent material. And the idea was to use agricultural waste materials. So we started with banana fiber, rice, corn, straw, wheat, um, a couple of other things. And they took every one of those and were able to pulp those into absorbent materials. So what you see on the left is actually banana fiber pulped into something that was absorbent. And this was pretty exciting. And then when we started looking at it a little more closely, we realized that they might be free, but in fact there are a lot of other issues, like you have to transport the waste materials from all the places where they are generated to a place to process them. And 
you know, that transportation in Africa or Asia is a pretty scarce commodity and expensive. Um, so it wasn't quite as straightforward. And then we also realized that pulping, pulp mills are almost non-existent in Africa. So we, we were lucky, too, to find out from Weyerhaeuser that there's another approach in, in uh, existing roles of pre-made um, absorbent material that are shipped around the world. And that seemed really appealing because, in fact, the rolls look awfully much like the sanitary pads that we you know, had seen if you cut them in, in rectangles. So they also said that that approach could be very flexible in allowing us to fluff the materials in country, work with local businesses, which we always try to do, fo foster industry in countries, and you know, find ways to make thicker pads, thinner pads, you know, that the market could dictate what the, the direction they went. And personally, the thing that appeals to me the most is the idea of you know, trying to find a way to use maybe biodegradable plastics to get around some of the um, environmental issues, and also kind of the hybrid idea of maybe coming up with a a re partially reusable um, pad system that could hold the, the, the absorbent material in place, but then like a compostable in, in interior absorbent part. So I find that really exciting. And um, I know, go figure. But, um, but so right now at PATH, we are literally knee deep in sanitary pads from all around the world. We've put out all points bulletin to all of our travelers and asked them to collect pads from wherever they go. So we've got a whole bunch of them that we're testing along with some from the US to try to figure out what, what are the standards? What, what should we tra be trying to hit as a, as a level of, ab of absorbency? Because we, we want to make a better pad, not just a pad. So in the process of doing this, we are learning so much about what makes a good sanitary pad. And <laughs> um, by the way, this is not real blood. It's, powdered milk that's dyed red. Um, so this is, we're excited because we're learning a huge amount and it's something that we can share with, with the various small groups that we're encountering in other countries that are working hard with very little resources to try to come up with their own pads. So just to say that what differences will make to Beatrice and girls like her, we don't know for sure, but it may not, you know, find a, a solution for global warming and it may not end, you know, um, HIV, but it might. We don't know until we hear the voices of these girls. And the world is waiting. It's time we find out.